Welcome to um, lecture 6.8 uh, of the six weeks in the course of machine learning. The theme of this lecture is convolutional networks. Uh, and this lecture is divided into two parts. So you can see now we approach the end um, of, the, of this week. Uh, so we covered the mainstream of, of um, kind of default artificial neural networks in the middle here. We talked about recurrent networks. We talked also then about associative memory. And now uh, we will focus on co convolutional neural networks, uh, which has a specific orientation towards solving problems uh, of visual character. A convolutional neural network, abbreviated CNN, uh, is a class of ANNs uh, primarily triggered uh, by the challenges of image recognition. So CNN architectures are strongly influenced by our current neuroscience models of the organization of human and animal visual perception. So the central con convolution mechanisms of CNN are inspired by receptive fields and their direct connections to the specific neural structures. The implementation of these mechanisms are based on the concept of convolution function in mathematics. CNNs are use relatively little pre-processing compared to other image classification algorithms. This means that the network learns the filters that in traditional algorithms were hand-engineered. This independence from prior knowledge and human effort in feature design is a major advantage of this approach. I want to focus now uh, on the particular problem that this, uh, uh, these techniques aim uh, to solve. And essentially the best label for, for the problem area is M image recognition. The classical problem in computer vision is that of determining whether or not the image data contains some specific object, some specific features, or some activities uh, of a specific kind. Uh, and there are actually a few different varieties uh, of the recognition problem. So one one can say is object recognition or object rather object classification. So uh, the idea is to be able to recognize whether the image includes some instances of a particular object. But it's not the instance itself, it's rather uh, the class. So uh, as an example, uh, if there is an image with a number of animals, we are interested in knowing which kind of animals, not, not, not whether it's a particular dog, but whether there are dogs or cats uh, or any other animal. It can also be so. Uh, not, not only to decide uh, which kind of object, but also uh, it could be interesting to know uh, how these are positioned uh, within the image. The second um, part is identification, um, where we really want to understand whether uh, there is a in the individual instance, a specific instance of object, object that occurs on the image. Uh, and as you can understand, there are uh, very important uh, applications here, like face recognition or like fingerprint uh, recognition and so on. Uh, and it can also be uh, things like uh, identification of handwritten digits so it's not, the task is not just to decide whether it's a digit or not, because that's, uh, that's object classification, but rather saying this is an A, this is a B, and, and so on. The third uh, sub-area is detection, So which, which is a little broader, which say that we want to detect not if there is a specific category of objects, specific object, but rather if... Uh, there are certain conditions uh, that we can discover in this image. 
so this can be then particular features uh, of, of the image or features of the objects in, um, uh, in, in the image. And um, detection is based on relatively simple and fast computations. It is sometimes used for finding smaller regions of interesting image data, which can be further analyzed. Uh, so not solving the problem entirely, but rather finding prom prom promising uh, subproblems to go further with using uh, other techniques. As a parenthesis, small parenthesis, I want to mention that there exists something that I think already mentioned in one of the first lectures called the ImageNet. So the ImageNet project is a large visual database designed to be used uh, as a tool for object rec recognition software development and research. So more than 14 million images have been hand annotated by the project. And also, uh, this um, database contains uh, more than 20,000 categories of objects. Uh, and uh, I would say, in general, there are hundreds of images representing individuals from these categories. Uh, also, uh, uh, in relation to this project, uh, in 2010, one started uh, a yearly software contest where companies, academics and others who, who developed uh, image recognition systems uh, would compete uh, on, on, a, on a specific, uh, specifically selected uh, subset of uh, image recognition tasks. Uh, and actually, this contest is considered one of the important benchmarks today uh, uh, regarding object recognition systems. Uh, so let's now try to pinpoint a little further exactly what the problem scenario is that we're going to attack with this kind of architectures. So, so actually, the starting point is an image input in standard pixel form. So, so, so actually, there is some pre-processing uh, uh, required. Uh, so whatever image we have, it is assumed that that image is transformed into some kind of pixel form. And of course, the granularity uh, of, of, of that pixel array is up for decision. But uh, in order for the system to able to handle the image, it has to have a specific form. Uh, and so that's the input. The output for this kind of system is actually a compact symbolic characterization uh, of, of the image. And that could be as simple as it's just uh, a, a number. It could be a symbol and a number. It could be as simple as this is just a number uh, referring to one of a specific class of objects that you want to find in, in the image. But it all could be more, more complex. It could be a number of features. It, it could be... But normally, it's a pretty compact symbolic description uh, and, and um, absolutely finite, but not even finite. But, but, but of, of a small size. Uh, so, so this is the input output. So then uh, we can say there are many kinds of systems. Uh, on, the, on what we have looked now uh, this week is artificial neural networks. So um, one could build, try to build this kind of system with the standard uh, feed forward uh, networks that we started to talk about in the beginning of the week. But of course, there are also other techniques. I mean, we studied earlier in this course symbolic techniques. And then nothing prevents that you try to attack this kind of problem through, uh, through the symbolic technique. However, uh, it's clear that an image is not symbolic. An image, uh, uh, if you want to solve an image recognition problem, with symbolic techniques, there is a considerable amount of 
pre-processing that have to be done so that you really from the image uh, in a manual way uh, map that image to a form that can be handled by a sim symbolic system. Uh, so for the standard neural network system, there is also not as much, but some manual mapping that have to be done in order uh, for being able to handle this. It's not because theoretically you could probably uh, think of, of creating uh, an AM <coughs> for this purpose, but uh, the computation would be too overwhelming. So pre-processing is needed here too. Uh, so one of the features now when we look at this what we call uh, a convolutional neural network is that we want to squeeze down and minimize the pre-processing. Probably not to zero, but at least very much more than in the other approaches. Uh, this slide is here just to emphasize the kind of input we are dealing with. We are dealing with uh, arrays of pixels. And this could be rather coarse, it could be a really rough uh, picture with not so many pixels, and it could be a very fi fine grain. But under all circumstances, uh, we, we are looking at arrays uh, typically of numbers, digits or real numbers, that uh, uh, for each uh, pixel. And typically there are a large number uh, of these elements in these arrays. So exactly what kind of standards for setting up these uh, inputs is, is, is not important. Of course, you always, when you come to doing a real application, you have to know exactly what kind of data you use. But in general, uh, it would be possible to, to apply these kinds of systems uh, to, to a range uh, of input formats. Uh, one of the more common formats used is called the uh, RGB, which stands for red, green, blue, blue uh, images, which is actually a, a model where uh, you work uh, with a three-dimensional array. Uh, so, of course, you have the two trivial dimensions for, for the image uh, area, but then you also have three, uh, three layers. Uh, which represent uh, the, the degree of, of, of red, green, blue colors that constitute then build up uh, the, tr uh, the true color uh, of, of that uh, pixel. Uh, and typically what you then what we then will have, uh, I bring it up not because I want you to learn everything about the IRGB model, but rather as an example that we will find, in each pixel is a number. And in this case, it's typically a number between 0 and 1. And uh, 0 rep represents black, and 1 represents white. Uh, and, but there can be a spectrum. I mean, so of course, uh, you can also uh, use this if you just make the right choices. You, you, you can also uh, model uh, like a black and white, uh, uh, like bl black and white pictures or grayscale pictures uh, as one 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 extreme. Let's then elaborate a little also on the input or uh, on the output from from this kind of system. So um, output could be one of several object categories present in the image. It could be specific objects, uh, individuals present there. It could be subsets of features of objects or categories observable in the image. It necessarily always interested in, 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 the, in the categories and, and the instances, but rather whether certain features um, are represented uh, or highlighted. Uh, we could also be interested to, to 
to uh, decide on certain geometrical or topological features are uh, present in, in the image. And um, also, but that's more like an extension if there are some dynamic properties of inset. But, but typically then dynamics, if you want to study dynamics, you, you need to look uh, at the sequence of image like in a movie or in a film or in a, in a, in a video. Uh, so all these above uh, elements can of course be represented as the way uh, we decide uh, in, in symbolic or, or numeric form. Uh, many times we, we still stick to our <laughs> default representation, a feature vector where the elements of the vector are either symbols or, or numbers. I now want to say a few words about the neur uh, neural science background uh, that has really filled the role of inspiration for some of, of the techniques we are going to look to. Uh, so what you see here is some uh, pictures uh, describing how we believe that the, the human vision systems look like. And uh, I guess the main me message here is that the human vision system uh, is very complex, very specialized. Uh, it, it's not a, a uniform, uh, simple model. It's, it's a very tailored model that obviously been developed during many tens of millions uh, of years. And as you can see, uh, the important thing is from the eye, there is a complex connection to some part of the brain in the back of the head, to something called the visual cortex. Uh, but this visual cortex is not a simple thing in itself. It, it's, a, uh, it's a complex structure with, with many parts, where these parts uh, have, have, have different roles. The, and actually one can go one step further. So what you see here, and I absolutely do not want to go into any details here, but this is just there here to symbolize that for, if we just look at the visual cortex, um, uh, in neuroscience today, uh, people have a pretty clear idea about, uh, or abstract model, how the visual cortex seems to work. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, one important fact is that people believe that the visual cortex has many levels. Uh, so you see the numbers here, we one, we two, we three, we four, etc. So you have many components. Uh, and actually, as it seems to work, uh, the, 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 uh, the faces here with the low numbers uh, take care of the Im immediate signals. So, so, so the lower levels handle uh, more atomic uh, properties uh, in, in an image, while uh, the areas with higher numbers in this model takes care of more, more, more complex uh, phenomena that uh, are, of course, built up from, from, from the simple ones. Uh, so, the existence of these kinds of uh, uh, rather complex hierarchical structure uh, in neuroscience was the source of inspiration that people in artificial neural network who initially believed uh, that uh, you could build any complex system just with a simple homogeneous neural network model. Suddenly they uh, realized at a point that if you want to do something serious in a complex area like like uh, like visual recognition, you probably have to have a rather elaborate system uh, because you cannot cheat. I mean, nature uh, nature has developed this kind of systems over millions of years. If we want to do it artificially, we we have to be prepared. We can have a general model in the background, but we have to be prepared to adapt it and specialize it in the same way as nature have seemed to uh, handle it 
over over long time. So, um, uh, what is the most? I know. Say a few words of what's in this complex area. What is of most relevance uh, for the technical topic we are going to focus on? So, and what's most relevant as a source of inspiration is some work in the early you know, 50s and 60s by, by some researchers called Hubel and Wiesel, who are actually awarded the Nobel Prize for their work. And actually, what they, this work was about, uh, how to study the, um, uh, the visual system of, a, of cats and monkeys. Uh, and actually, one of the findings were important findings were that it turned out that their their, uh, their empirical studies showed uh, that there were neurons in the cortical region uh, in in one part of the head that had a specific role with respect uh, uh, to to the, uh, imaging uh, parts of, of the visual field. So it was not so that there were a lot of neurons that, that uh, worked together on, on analyzing uh, every image uh, that occurred, but there are th rather that it was a very specialized system where, where special small regions of the visual field had a coupling to very specific neurons. So this was something new uh, at, at, at the time. And the reason why they managed to do this research was actually that they had an experimental technique where they, for the first time, I would say, ever could really uh, make measurements on singular neurons in the brain. So, so the experimental techniques they developed, they made it possible to study this in the first place. So what they say is that provided the eyes are not moving the regions of visual space within which visual stimuli affect uh, the firing of single neurons, we call uh, these uh, subfields receptive fields. So, um, and there is a coupling, according to them, from certain receptive fields, small subfields, uh, onto specific neurons. And neighboring neurons have similar and overlapping receptive fields. So you can say there is a small army of neurons that, that look at the uh, uh, receptive field, different parts from different angles. And, uh, but, but if we look at the sum of all these neurons and the receptive fields they, they cover, uh, uh, they together uh, form a very systematic and complete picture of, of, of the image at hand. Uh, and the way uh, the neurons respond to the stimuli from their respective fields is called uh, neuronal tuning. Uh, also, in their work, they, they, they distinguish between uh, simple cells and complex cells. And this relates, I would say, to what I already showed you in this model people, um, researchers have about the human visual system, that there are different levels. And in the earlier levels, um, uh, the functionalities are, are, are more simple. So, so the neurons in those areas take care of the microphenomena in, in, in an image, while, uh, while the neurons in, in later uh, areas take care looks at more complex uh, phenomena. And they also proposed, actually, uh, some method for, for combining these, for cascading. Uh, uh. And actually, we'll see that even if it's in a simplified way, uh, the um, convolution networks actually try to do something like that, that they try to build a hierarchy uh, of levels uh, that look uh, uh, also based on something uh, reminiscent of receptive fields, and then they, in a hierarchical fashion, look at more and more high-level phenomena. The background from neuroscience that I talked about in the last few slides have inspired very much of the architecture uh, of the, these CNN systems. However, 
the name convolution networks come from not from neuroscience it's come from mathematics so it turns out that the technique used in this system uh, uh, to implement uh, this uh, segmentation uh, of, of the input image uh, is actually based on a specific uh, mathematical function called convolution. So I want to say a few words about that before we go into um, the descriptions of the architecture. Uh, so convolution is a mathematical operation on two functions, f and g, to produce a third function that expresses how the shape of one, uh, normally the first, f, are modified by the other, j. And it's defined as an integral, uh, so, so the convolution of these two functions uh, is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity over the product, the multiplication of f at a point a, the multiplication of f of a with j of x minus a, and the integration is over a. So one way of describing how one can go about uh, uh, practically uh, for, 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 for looking, uh, evaluating uh, the convolution are as follows. So, so first of all, you have to define these functions. And these functions are defined through this dummy variable a. Uh, I mean, the function is in terms of x. So, so x is a as a dummy variable used in the integration. Uh, and then you, we reflect uh, one of the functions, j, the one, the way with function that we are going to use to modify uh, the, the form of, of f. Uh, so we, we uh, and, and the reflection of j a in, in the y axis is j minus, uh, of minus a. Uh, and then we have this time offset. Uh, and the time offset is so uh, that we use the time offset to let, uh, so to say, the function j glide along uh, the a-axis from minus uh, infinity to plus infinity. Um, and you, you, you see a few examples, uh, one example uh, to, the, to the right, so you can see you have two functions. So, 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 so actually what you do in practice uh, that you let the second uh, function glide. And then there are simply four, normally four cases. So there is a case where j is still out, uh, um, outside the realm of f. So there is no connection. So therefore, always the multiplication back to zero. Okay. Uh, then there is a period where j moves into uh, the area, uh, definition area for f. And then there is a, a third phase where it moves out of the area. And then there is the final phase where it's outside but to the right. And then it's zero again. So, 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 so the problem that remains is to define uh, uh, this function in the two middle, uh, mid middle phases. So uh, what we do is we, we, we compute a sliding weighted sum of function f with the weighting function j minus a. And then the resulting waveform uh, is, is, is the convolution. Uh, so you can see here the example f uh, times j. You can see it's not a square function, it's not a step function anymore. It's, it's, it, has another, it has another shape. There are also some other functions in mathematics that are pretty similar, cross-correlation, autocorrelation, but, but in this case, convolution was the main source of inspiration. So we continue, um, uh, we break here and continue with uh, part two in a minute. Thank you.